Good morning. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. I'm also, I like some call and response. So good morning. Thank you. That was better. Um, so hello and welcome. I'm super impressed. I saw people at the party last night who I also see in the crowd this morning. So shout out to your discipline. Um, I appreciate it. We're going to get started. We have an incredibly juicy panel. Yes to this cute little baby. Um, one request of folks though, is that if you can to just move up for the panelists, for all the things, it'd be beautiful to see faces um, and it's hard to see them with the light. So if you are in the back of the room, yes, see, look, thank you, Saul. Thank you, Brendan. Yes, beautiful. I love it. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and dig in. Um, first of all, thank y'all so, so much. It's been such a gift to be building with y'all the last day. And so we are incredibly excited for today, which includes a lot of um, small group conversations and a, a, a bit of time in this space with folks who've been doing this work. Um, and I'm gonna share about that work and be, we got some real talk tonight and we have some looking back this morning. So thank y'all so, so much um, for making it. So yesterday we really started the day with the panel talking about, um, about the moment that we are in about the assessment of the threats that we face, about what we think is possible because of them. Um, and then also situated ourselves physically in St. Louis and the work and the legacy of organizing and resistance that has happened here. And so this morning, we wanna take a minute to also look back. We think it's impossible to know what questions to ask or what way to move if we are not clearly situated in how actually the present moment builds on not only generations of struggle, but also a resistance of hope and a vision. And so this morning we have two incredible panelists. And I have to say, I have like huge intellectual crushes on both these people. I do, it's true. Um, and they're just some of the smartest, brightest folks who have sharpened me over the last decade. Um, and so I'm really, really grateful. De it's more than a decade, if I'm being honest, because I'm grown. <laughs> um, but I'm really honored to have them both. Um, I want to just also name, uh, we have on the program, M. Adams, who could not make it today because of COVID. So shout out to M. Please send her prayers. Um, she's doing well, but couldn't be here. But we're really lucky to have Tinjiri McHarris, um, who y'all got a little sample of yesterday on the panel. Um, but is an incredible organizer, thinker, um, and just an incredible mover in these times. So Tinji's gonna hold us for this conversation, along with Robin Kelly, who as many of you do know and should know is an incredible intellectual, but also a movement supporter and hero, um, starting with the South African apartheid struggle through today. And so we are really lucky to have the two of y'all together. And I'm super excited to be asking questions. So the way this is gonna flow, is that we're gonna have about 30 or so minutes of questions for them. And then we're gonna open it up. One thing we wanted to make sure we prioritize is the brilliance of voices in this space. So if you have a question that's bubbling and make sure it's a question, not a dissertation, but if you have a question, we really do invite you to ask it. So we'll have time at the end, we'll take three or four in a row and stack them. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, so I wanna actually start, I think with Robin, but again, invite both of y'all throughout this conversation to, to chime in. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about this moment and not people in this room necessarily, but generally as unprecedented. They talk about kind of the Supreme Court is going rogue as if it's the first time that it's done that. Um, and the, the popularity of fascism and white supremacists is somehow new to this country or even this globe. Um, and I think many of us who have been kind of inside of movement think about the Dred Scott decision, think about the summer of 1919 and the long history of white supremacy and lynching um, and have a different understanding. But as a historian, can you situate us in the moment that we're in? How do we really understand what is unprecedented, what's not, um, and what should we learn from that? Okay. If I go first? Yes. Okay, good. Um, there's an echo in here. <laughs> um, anyway, it's great to be here with all of you. Normally, I would say love to all the people that I have friendships and long time, but I don't have time for that because time is short. Um, and we, we have a very short period of time. So thank you so much, Marbury, for inviting me as, as, as usual. Um, of course, nothing we're seeing here is unprecedented. Uh, and I think most people here know this. I mean, fascism's roots, for example, in the U.S. Uh, predate the 1930s. You know, it's rooted in settler colonialism. Uh, white supremacy is a foundation for this country. And if you use the bare bones definition of a liberal democracy, that is to say free universal suffrage, civil liberties, um, and the right of habeas corpus, 
then the U.S. has only been a democracy for probably a little over 50 years. And that's kind of stretching it. And by the way, I'm going to use the term liberalism. Uh, and I just want to be clear that we understand what that means is a long definition, but the short version is liberalism is not antithetical to capitalism. It is the foundational ideology of capitalism. It is basically the idea of the rule of law, laissez-faire, small government, right? It changes over time, but there's no way that liberalism should be associated with anything that would be considered radical, progressive, or even socialist. <laughs> it's the opposite. Okay, I just wanna make sure that we understand that. Um, but also in, in asking, in answering the question about uh, where we are now, how we situate ourselves politically, um, I just wanna just make the point that we have to always think globally, that the US is an empire and challenges to its hegemony co often come from the subject peoples around the globe. Um, whether we're talking about what's happening in Palestine right now, or the fact that you have recent left victories in uh, Colombia and Chile and places like that, these are all challenges to US empire. And that means that we have to confront the implications of a weakening US imperial power and how it might impact our actual lives and livelihoods. So sometimes improving our conditions here may actually have a deleterious condition, um, impact depending on what we do. So that means that it's a very important to resist US militarism, to defend migrant labor, to resist systems that allow capital to be borderless, for people to be subjected to borders and administrative violence. Um, and our task ought to be to bring down what Dr. King called the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. Um, I think the reason that the current movement feels unprecedented to so many people, especially liberals, see, I don't like liberals, just so you know, um, is because our liberal framing of history, that is this idea of continual progress, uh, this teleology is so dominant. So like, for example, if you say, well, wait a second, we've lived through chattel slavery. We lived through actual civil war, not the civil war of the capital of January 6th. People say, well, you know, or, or if you say, you know, we lived through a period when whole groups of people were just disfranchised, like after reconstruction, you get back, oh, well, that was then, you know, but we've made progress. This is not about going back in time. Um, the fact is, if you look at the Supreme Court decisions, I'm in a room full of lawyers and legal scholars and activists. I don't have to tell you that the Supreme Court is behaving consistently with the way it has behaved historically. I mean, you know, um, uh, uh, Marbury talked about a Dred Scott and it's Plessy. Plessy and Dred Scott give lie to the idea that the South was the bastion of racism. No, it was national. That's what those Supreme Court decisions actually told us. The Supreme Court, you know, upheld white primaries in 1898. Um, it upheld right to work laws. In 1921, declared picketing illegal and supported the right of courts to in issue injunctions against strikers. The Supreme Court upheld Japanese internment. Remember that, not just in 1940s, but in 1980s. Uh, the, the court's recent reversal of native sovereignty and land claims in Oklahoma is actually consistent with two centuries of rulings and law violating its own federal constitution that says treaty rights are the law of the land. Um, if you take Roe, and I wanna talk much about it because I think people have talked about it, um, Roe, basically overturned bans on abortions that are really only 60 years old. The federal ban on abortion, abortion goes, in, goes into effect 1910. Um, and of course we know that's because of the long 19th century struggle on the part of the male medical profession to wage war on midwives and doctors who actually were the main abortion providers. But I won't go into that. Oh, but I do wanna remind you that, you know, who, who signed the Hyde Amendment? Jimmy Carter. Gerald Ford wouldn't even sign it. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying, I'm saying, and I'm not saying this is not a defensive, this is basically saying it's across the board. Um, and so what we get after Roe is this constant war against abortion rights. The Adolescent Family Life Act, passed in 1981, upheld by the Supreme Court, right? And on and on and on. So this liberal framework of history as progress also focuses on the state that is to say the federal government in particular, as a solution, we have to get out of that. Uh, we get nostalgic about like the New Deal and great society programs. And I just wanna just push back on some ideas. I mean, I, I, I love some of our 
are great progressive legislators, but when they say that the New Deal is socialism, they're just lying to you. They, or they don't know. The new, I mean, if you look carefully, we find the, what, the, what the New Deal was a welfare state whose primary intention was to save capitalism, suppress workers' discontent. And specifically, here's an example of capitalism as racial, gendered, and ableist. It destroyed, it, I mean, New Deal policies destroyed food to prop up prices. It imposed work relief based on racial, gendered, and regional wage differentials. Um, it, based, it was based on a welfare state on the kind of male breadwinner model. It forced um, native assimilation. It also you know, uh, was part of the drive to, of deportation of Mexican workers. I mean, that's, that's all New Deal policies. If you look at it, it looks like the corporatist policies of Italy, right, in the 1930s, um, and of, of Germany. So we have to be real careful. It, it also pushed for the exclusion of occupations where black people predominated, domestic work, agriculture, and the most progressive, and let me just be fair, it was also a product of struggle, that some of the more progressive policies were the product of working class struggles, you know, and they won those, they won those, but then the Supreme Court struck down the most progressive aspects of the New Deal. Same thing you can say about the war on poverty and great society. In short, the war on poverty, great society was about policing poor people more than anything else. Um, liberal policies ended up, you know, further entrenching inequality, the oppression of black and brown and indigenous people, uh, and facilitating the extraction of wealth, some of the surplus being used to subsidize white working class and middle classes. Um, and this is why I sometimes take issue with the idea that we're just in this circle of this cycle of backlash that suggests that when black people make gains under some liberal regime, white folks get mad, then they push uh, to the right. And there's some truth to that. I mean, I'm saying that's not true, but what I'm suggesting is that it's the liberal regimes that oftentimes are the ones that are, produ are producing, reproducing these kinds of inequalities. We don't always see it. Um, so what's the final takeaway? What did we learn? Liberalism is not the solution, but the problem. And in fact, at no point in our history has a liberal regime in power actually improved the conditions of black people. Show me, show me in one example, actually improved the conditions of black people. When there was improvement, it was because people organized and won those rights, but it wasn't the liberal regime that did it. Um, our fiercest fights, most intense fights against repression have been under liberal regimes in the 20th century. Uh, secondly, and finally, the only time we create space or conditions for our survival is through struggle. This is a fact. Um, it's not through the courts. We've never stopped fighting. Liberalism never gave us anything. Rather, it responds to our struggles and co-ops our demands. And this is how we get carceral feminism. This is how we get a war in poverty that ends up being about policing. This is how we get civil rights legislation that delivers votes to Democrats. And what is increasingly a liberal so-called so abolition, uh, which is not abolition at all, the same faux abolition that would promote a feminist jail in New York City, okay? And that's, what, that's our lesson. That's what critical race theory teaches us, hopefully. That's I thought y'all were gonna get some history and some gems. I feel like I'm taking quotes from that. Thank you so much for situating us in that, Robin. The next question I wanna ask Tinji, but again, welcome either of y'all to touch on it. It's, you know, one of the things we say at L4BL is that this system isn't broken. That very often you hear like, we just have to tweak it or the system's broken. That in fact, to your point, the system is working exactly how it's supposed to, but its roots are rotten. That it's really based in and meant to do what it's doing. And I think you said, Robin, that you think this movement and this moment has the most visionary North Star and demands. And so I'm curious, Tinji Wei, can you talk a bit about the analysis of a rotten system of what it means to actually not just say we have to fix it, but actually kind of throw out so many of these systems, what it means for movement and the analysis of movement and how it informs the North Star, the vision of this current iteration of Black liberation. Sure, thanks, Marbury. How y'all doing? I have to say, it's, it's very hard going after Robin Kelly. <laughs> I met you actually, I don't know if you remember, eight years ago in St. Louis. I yeah. I um, so I just, I just know like, um, I'm just very humble just to even share space and thanks for your kind words, Marbury. And even just in hearing you just really grounded and, and I often find 
this is a moment where we have to be the, um, courageous enough to be humble and bold and understand that we're always, hello? We're always students and we're always learning, we're always challenging ourselves. Um, but I'm grateful for us to be grounded in, in history. Because history, I think, does a number of things, but only if we choose to treat history with a level of boldness and humility and open eyes, as opposed to um, trying to consume a version of history that feeds a comfort and um, moves us away from a, a place in which it pushes us into boldness. And you said this earlier, it's not just, it's not just being grounded in history, it's how we interpret history that's really important. And, and I think there's this quote where history doesn't repeat itself. And I've had comrades like really push. History doesn't repeat itself, but there is, there is a rhythm, there is a rhyme. So what, what does history have to offer and teach us? And I think, I think a few things. I think history grounds us um, in the long arc of liberation struggle and in the, in, in the long arc of how we've arrived in, 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 in where we are now. I think history also, it challenged us to un understand not just where we come from, but what is our commitment to generations coming after us? If we are, we have a duty, when I think about this generation, just, just movements, we are part of our work is the unfinished business of liberation. And so when we think about what ha the, the work of our ancestors, the work of social movements before us, we have to also be grounded in questions in the present, but we have to think about what are we leaving for generations coming? What will be the unfinished business that they will have to take up to make their, to make their freedom whole? It is not enough to just talk about uh, the moment that we live in. We have a duty and a responsibility to future generations, to young, to people not yet born so that they are part of an, 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 an arc of liberation. And I feel like history reminds us of that. But, but a few reasons around why we can't, why we can't be um, diluted into the, to this idea that we have to reform a system that is deeply rotten is, is because of a number of things. We are here as a result of racial capitalism. We are here because racial capitalism produces crisis after crisis after crisis after crisis. It produces ongoing suffering for our people over and over and over again. We are in this moment because financial institutions, banks control our economy because our people do not have control over the resources that they need in order to survive. We are here because governments deregulate um, have forced, uh, have moved deregulation so that wealth can accumulate in a way that it consolidates power, consolidates wealth, where our people keep suffering over and over again. And what we have to be very mindful as social movements is capitalist problems, problems that are a pro product of racial capitalism cannot be resolved with capitalist solutions. And oftentimes we are in a moment where we are seeing people are having a crisis of legitimacy of the state. Folks are tired of bosses and they're tired of their governments being in service of the bosses, being in service of, of, of capitalists. And so we, what we are watching around the world, and we have decade after de decade after decade, is powerful, beautiful uprising and frustration with capitalism. And what we have to be mindful of as social movements, as organizers, that we cannot be, we have to reject and challenge any strategy to that promotes capitalist solutions to, particularly because that circumvents revolution. And so that, that's part of the work that, that we're in. The other piece is white supremacy. Yes, we are seeing a moment of fascism. Yes, we are seeing a moment of white nationalism and white supremacy. But white nationalism, nationalism, white supremacy is embedded in the fabric of American society. And in fact, it only emerges in extreme ways when it feels most under threat. It is checking us when it feels like we are stepping out of line and building too much power. Our job is not to be less powerful. Our job is not to be pushed back to the center. What we are being told, whether it's defund, when we are demanding less money for the police, when we are talking about defunding the Pentagon, we are being told that our ideas are too radical and, and, and what we are doing is we're suffering under the consequences of our boldness. We must reject that at, at all costs because what it is telling us is that there will be, there will be a, a consequence to your power. Well, then bring it. Our job is to be more powerful. If they are, if they feel under threat, it is our job to make sure they feel threatened. 
but it is also our job to uh, undermine the, the strategy of our opposition and our enemy. It is political malpractice to build power and not undermine the power of your enemy. That is our mandate now. So we must build power as social movements. We must consolidate power and we have to, we have to create within our strategy, how do we undermine our opposition? And part of that is that we, they are not, while there is alignment, while there is a lot, there is contradictions amongst the ruling class. There's contradictions amongst the right. And when I say right, I don't just mean the far right. I mean the economic right as well. Neoliberals are part of the economic right. The right, we are not just watching the rise of a far, we are watching a particular faction of the right that is rising. But, and part of the contradictions, part of the things that we have to really understand so that we can we can fracture them even more is, is some of their differences, particularly amongst the economic right, between economic nationalists and neoliberals. But at the, and, and I'll stop because then I sometimes, but at the end of the day, our job here, and this is one thing that I just want you because I have felt it, is is our the more that we become bold, the more they will come for us. So our job is to prepare for the coming because we shall not not be bold. That is what our ancestors told us and prepared us to do, is to be bold, to be courageous, and to get ready because they will come. And that's the work that we're in now. I'm just gonna let that sit for a minute. Um, so I feel like the question you asked about how are we undermining the work of our opposition and how are we building power is just so important for this group of people in the work you hold every day. Like, how are you part of that vision? You're so powerful. So I'm going to breathe with that. Thank you, Tunjibe. Um, So this is for both of y'all. Uh, Mim Kaba, who we love at Alphabio, um, often writes, there you go, she gets a shout out. <laughs> often writes that we must study history not to repeat it, to Tinjui's point, but to, to ask better questions, to figure out what is the sharpening that we have to use in this moment. So for both of you all, what are some powerful examples from history of both organizing, but also for this crowd legal innovations from the past, from movements that have built power, that have been bored? And what can we learn from those efforts? What are kind of specific examples folks should spend some time with? I'm, I'm not going after Tim Jiwei on this. I'm sorry. I, I'm, still, I'm still like trying to get the fire off my jacket. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah, we, we did meet in St. Louis right during the Ferguson thing. And, I, and I've been following Tim Jiwei ever since. Um, and Marbury and I, we met in class when she was my student at Columbia. So I'm, I'm like the luckiest person on the planet here. Um, this is a really important question. Of course, I agree with Mariam. Um, who can't agree with? Yeah. Um, you know, and, but then I, I thought about a couple things. Um, once we, you know, this goes back to what Tenjiwa was saying about building power. Because once we begin to talk about what we think of as powerful examples or precedents, um, it raises this question of success, of what it means for movements to succeed and fundamentally, if the, if, the, if the project is transforming society, then that's a big call. Um, and it takes something more than uh, winnable campaigns. And we're in a room full of some people who work for foundations, right? And foundations sometimes are forced into this thing where, where they impose upon us this idea of winnable campaigns, passing laws that are transformative, taking state power. But what does it mean to win? And why does that matter? Winning is not the same thing as, as building power. Um, you know, it means base building, cultivating a vision of the world uh, that we're trying to build. Some of the vision is in, on the back of the wall there. Um, so, you know, when I wrote the book Freedom Dreams, I was trying to move beyond this kind of bipolar understanding of social movements as either winning or losing, you know, to focus instead on this collective radical imagination that conjures and sustains visions of freedom in the darkest of times. So if we were to go through some examples, just I'll give you three real quickly. Um, we can talk about spectacular victories by movements in the past, like um, the Black Panthers and the Young Lords, uh, you know, which did amazing things, you know, at the level of kind of creating alternative institutions, right? Um, we can also talk about uh, uh, 
but, 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 but let me say, but these were short-lived movements that some of them collapsed under their own internal contradictions, right? And I think that's important to realize. Um, but I would also point to movements that did patient work of collective thinking, base building, right here in St. Louis, is the Organization of Black, for Black Struggle, which is now 42 years old, been doing a lot of work, laid the foundations for almost all the struggles that we see. And to me, I would hold them up just like I'd hold up Mississippi, you know, SNCC leading to the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, to the Mississippi Freedom Labor Union, to Collective Farms, all that stuff. Or go, go to Brooklyn, Sister to Sister is one of my favorite organizations. Um, or even organizations that do revolutionary work and yet, you know, did more in terms of laying out a kind of political education and a vision, even if the numbers were small and they didn't do anything like take over a state, like the Combahee River Collective, for example. The impact the Combahee River Collective has had has been greater than a lot of organizations we prop up, right? Um, so finally, I just want to just make this point that once we move, once we move beyond winning um, as a, a kind of uh, quantifiable thing, beyond success, and we actually see the Black radical tradition not as a hierarchy of individuals and organizations, but as a field of struggle. It's not a single organization, but many, many, mostly unknown working together. In fact, my editors always get mad at me because I would have these paragraphs where I'd list like 25, 30, 40 organizations. All, they say, you can't do that. So of course I can, because they represent a field. But when you look at it, then we have to th think about not studying organizations, individually, but fields of movements, intergenerational. To look at a place like Mississippi or Chicago, or especially Detroit. Detroit, where the impact of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, the Black Workers Congress, James and Gracie Boggs, have spawned a truly revolutionary movement culture in, through Detroit Summer, through the Boggs Center, through the Detroit Justice Center, We the People of Detroit, Freedom Freedom Collective, No Allegiance Nation, Complex Movement, East Side Solutionaries, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, Detroit Narrative Agency, and, and on and on and on. You have a field there. So I think that what we have to look at, that's building power. Detroit, Jackson, Mississippi, Philadelphia, all these, these powers being built through these fields as opposed to just like these successful organization. And if funders are really interested, not that we need funders all the time, is they need to stop measuring movements by winnable campaigns and give money to build power and just keep giving it and giving it. So that's my, that's my answer. I'll be brief. I, you just, uh, winning is not the same as building power is just is sitting with me. And I, uh, because I think that that's one of the biggest enemies to social movements is, 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 a, is, a, is adopting the idea that winning certain things that actually don't reduce the suffering of our people, that don't actually mitigate harms and don't shift the locus of power is, is actually moving our people towards victory and, and building power. And unfortunately, because of the hyper-professionalization of social movements, we have adopted this philosophy of campaign-centric, winnable, measurable efforts that that funders and other, whether it's funders, media, et cetera, response to. And we, we really have to do the hard individual organizational institutional work of rejecting that. Because if not, then we are actually essentially going to be in this cycle over and over and over and over again. And the, the type of winnings that often is like these policy victories that again, some of these policy victories actually give more power to the state as opposed to have more power within our communities. And oftentimes we call those reformist reforms that actually don't really shift the conditions. And then there's also other types of winning that I've talked about before. And one of the dangerous ones is around the sort of the concept of popularity, the sort of cultural gains, the, 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 this idea of, of that we've won something when it actually doesn't provide us more power. And it, it puts us in a position where we're, we're diluted and confused. I always say this in, in organizations and when I'm in community with people, your biggest threat is not to know the answer to something. Your biggest threat is to, is to operate within confusion and think that you know what the hell you're doing. When I think about what's required in this moment, and even for me, 
I think about what's required of us. And the, the thing that comes to me the most is profound humility. I am in search of the right question that I don't know the answer to. I am not running towards an answer that will be wrong and repurpose history over and over and over again, dishonoring my ancestors and creating disappointing future generations. So we have to lean in with great humility and boldness um, and courage. So I just wanna, just like, uh, just grateful for that. Cause then I think about power, this like this, and oftentimes we throw it around too. We don't define power with each other. We use it so loosely. And so that, and so we often don't know how to build it. But, but at the end of the day, power is our ability to be self-determined, self-governed, and that we are able to, to, to make the decisions over our, our, over our lives. That is power. And we have to be in the build, business of power. And so that, that's part of the, the project and the work that we have to do. And, and when I think about social movements of the past, I think about those that talked about power, but also put forward a vision that wasn't a multi-month, multi, but a multi-decade vision that imagined generations out what would be the hard work of shifting the conditions of actual revolution, of actual liber liberation, of the actual fall of racial capital of the actual fall of sort of the global elite, the, the, billion, the billionaire class having, having power. When I think about social movements, they thought about that. So, so for me, and I know I said this yesterday, part of our work of this moment is to not develop strategies for next year, but to be thinking decades out, what is the work of revolution and what is my duty in this particular moment? Oftentimes rapid work or immediate is put in, in conflict with long-term work. That is a false dichotomy. It just means if you are acting rapidly in the moment and you don't have a long-term vision, you are not situated within a liberatory vision and strategy and plan. So there is no either or. We actually have to do the hard work of building liberatory vision, of building a multi decade strategy and vision, and then understanding what, are, what is our duty and moment in, these, in this time um, for us. And, and, and I, the other things I just wanna say too about social movements, I feel like what is a way, and I hope it's okay to say, I don't know. I often think about social movements in a way where, how do we honor the powerful, um, what the, the, the honor our, our ancestors and what came before us, even honor social movements without romanticizing them in a way that gives us, that, that, that like we're, we can't actually learn the real lessons. Like I actually wanna understand the contradictions. I actually wanna stand some of the challenges and then the mistakes. Because when I think about the social movement now, I think about what is our responsibility to not just talk about the victories, but also to talk about the challenges, the contradictions, the lessons, the ways in which we had to understand how are we in relationship with each other that strengthens us. And so I, I, I just, I often think about that. Um, I'm sure I have more to say, but let me just stop. So we have about 15 or so minutes for questions. So I want to open that up. I think we have a mic Leno who can help with that too. Um, but if you have a question, go ahead, put your hand up. Um, and we'll take, I think, two or three um, on deck, keep them brief, um, and then we will have them answered. I think Kat has a mic. Thank you so much, Kat. Shout out to Kat. <laughs> Um, I was just hoping that y'all could clarify um, the definition of base building. That's another term that um, I personally have heard be thrown around with really unclear definitions. And it seems like that's uh, intentional in some ways. So if y'all could provide that clarification, I'd appreciate it. Beautiful. Right, no, it's, that's a really quick question. Oh, you're taking three, right, I'm sorry. Let's take a few. I think someone else in this row had a question. And maybe say your name and pronouns for us just so we know who's talking. Sure, um, thank you. My name is Alexis Yuboa Cody. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I just wanted to name how um, the collapsing, what you were saying about the collapsing uh, contradictions and how organizations uh, collapse under their own contradictions can be uh, very much said for the nonprofit organizations and the legal organizations that are getting a lot of this funder money. Um, and so building off of that, um, a lot of my mentors who are lawyers and I'm an attorney as well, um, were our human rights lawyers who are willing to put their, who were willing to put their bodies on the line for the movement. I have seen with my peers that there is um, a high risk aversion 
to wanting to be in that space while still claiming community lawyering and movement lawyering in this way. So my question is, how do we learn from these elders and also learn from history um, to lessen our, our risk aversion so that we are willing to put, be put in those spaces as lawyers and as people of privilege? Thank you. Thank you for that. So we'll take uh, one more and then we'll do another round. Yeah. So we're gonna do one more and then after, I think here, and then we'll come to you after the answer. Sorry about that. Um, hi, my name is Mark, uh, he, him. This is somewhat related, but like for both of the speakers, would you mind naming some of those contradictions and whether you're seeing them erupt in this present moment within any organizations and what we can, you know, what history teaches us about resolving those contradictions, addressing those contradictions. I love it. You like, let's name it. Okay, so let's do base building, how to learn to be less kind of risk of us, and then naming some of the contradictions. Right. That's a great question. Now, base building, it kind of comes out of Latin American movements, uh, especially around guerrilla warfare. But the idea of base building is simple. It's you're building long-term organizational structures where people can participate and be committed. And sometimes that means exactly what uh, Tenjiwe was talking about, that is figuring out ways to be self-determined to take care of one another. Uh, sometimes base building involves mutual aid, not as a short-term, but as a long-term goal of survival. Uh, and it also means political education. It just means establishing something that can last with full participation. And in the guerrilla warfare context, it meant like, peasants creating a base for which, you know, movements can survive and, 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 and sustain themselves. So that's really what that means. Just to, and just to add on that, the reason, and I think it's so important to talk about base building because we're, we're in the moment of like a mass engagement wave where that's become the dominant form of organizing where it's, it's really sort of like a, a, a significant output of information with like minimal participation on the other end. And, 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 and I think the one thing that we have to be very mindful of is, is engaging masses of people is not the same as organizing masses of people. And essentially like part of this work is we, we have a duty, especially in this moment, there are so many people who are longing for a political home, who are either afraid, confused, frustrated, angry. And, and we, ha we have a duty as social movements to create spaces of, of community, of belonging. And, you know, and so the, the work of base building is probably like the most important thing in this moment. And, and, and the duty is really to base build um, working class people across the country, particularly like in, I think about black working class folks across the country. And, and to what Robin said, the, the work of base building is, is not just like, it's not engagement, it's actually organizing people. It's, it's organizing with people. It's like centering, set, centering the working class in ways in which that we need to, whether, and it's also like thinking about this thing around uh, uh, mutual aid. I think about like material power and alternatives often. Like we can't challenge the state without, without engaging in alternative models about how to deal with the material needs of our people. And I tell you, if we don't contend with the material needs of our people, our people will reject us and they'll have every right to. Right. It is not enough to advocate around policy. It is not enough to do campaigning without understanding that our people are suffering, they are hungry, they are houseless, they are hurting. We have to contend with the material conditions of our people. That is a duty of social movements. And so that's, the, the, and so that's part of base building. And then the other piece I'll just say is also, it's around governance. We've, and this is part of the, the one contradiction around the NGO is the hyper professionalization of our, our of our of our of our movements and, and some of the limitations to sort of using NGOization as a tactic. Part of this is that our people should be like our people. If we we can't talk about self and Dimitri said it the other day. I think it's in the we can't talk about um, self determination and 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 and, and self governance without modeling, as Dee said yesterday, that our our social movements have to model the type of radical democracy that we often talk about. It can't model the sort of liberal bourgeoisie democracy that's hyper professionalized, and because in that way, that how do we actually do base building with with our people? So. Oh, the other one? The other side. Okay. Uh, risk aversion? Yeah. Oh. Okay. I mean, I think the thing around risk aversion is real, like people are afraid. You understand what I'm saying? And, and it reminds me of a lot of, the, of, lot of what Robin is, has written around when people are afraid and they're holding on to fear and this risk aversion, 
um, it often is also connected with a lack of political imagination and, 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 and an inability to find belonging. When we are, we all experience fear, and I said this yesterday, like suppressing fear don't, it don't save you. Like acting like you're not afraid won't save you. Uh, but what, but what, will, what will offer you something is a, le a level of like radical imagination that is so seeped in love and possibility and power and clarity around victory that you are so moved by that, that that, that warms you in a particular kind of way where fear doesn't disappear, but it, it doesn't, it's not suffering. It becomes, it becomes purposeful. What will I do? What am I willing to do for this thing called freedom? Like how moved am I? And so I think it's not about like shifting away from risk. Risk, risk aversion is what capitalism has taught you to do. It has taught your body to be afraid and to buckle up and run the other way. What we're supposed to do is create an invitation that is so powerful, so gorgeous, so moving that it's like, come, we, it's an invitation. It's an invitation to come on this side. And so that's, that's part of the work. And in terms of contradictions, I think the, all, the things that we have to contend with is that one, ain't no simple answers to these contradictions. Ain't no simple answers. We'll be in these contradictions for a very long time and it requires humility. I think some of the contradictions are like, how are we in the relationship with governance? How are decisions made? Where is power held? So we need to have, those are some of the contradictions I think about in terms of what we have to contend with in terms of organizations and, and social movements. Um, and, then, and then there are others as well, but I've been talking for a long time, so I'm just gonna stop. Oh, oh yeah, and, and just to follow up on the contradictions, because someone had asked a question like, can you name some? And, and, and we can name lots, <laughs> um, but can I, because since time is short, can I make a suggestion? One of the most important books that have been written in the last 20 years is Johanna Fernandez's book on Young Lords. Uh, it, and I really would suggest people read it. It's a powerful book, it's called Young Lords of Radical History by Johanna Fernandez. And in it, um, she talks about some of the amazing things Young Lords did in New York and Chicago, especially in New York, and with it lays out some of the acknowledged internal contradictions that led to its quick demise. Um, and so I don't want to go into details on that because we could talk about that later, but I would suggest you read that and lots of things, but that book is very important as a model for how to try to address those contradictions without necessarily dismissing the whole organization, but understand like where they come from around questions of gender, nationalism, you know, the use of violence or not, that kind of thing. Thank you so much. So we're gonna take one more round of questions. I know there was somebody here and then somebody in the front. Um, so yeah, that's the space. Hi, this is Javier de Janon, he, him. Um, it might be an intense question, but I think one of the biggest contradictions for me that's come up in this conversation is just the issue of lawyering and liberation because I think some radical folks would argue that lawyering is inherently feeding the state, right? Giving the state power, giving the state legitimacy. So I wonder where does the attorney fit in this movement building with folks who by all means just wanna tear it down, right? Destroy the law. Yes. I wanna preview you also, I wanna get the other two questions that this is also the entirety of the topic tonight. <laughs> so we should address it. And tonight, I think that question of like, is that even possible? What does that mean? It's gonna be so present. Let's do this one and this one, and then we'll have them answer the stack. Um, hi, my name's Chase. I use they, he pronouns. Um, and I've been doing a lot of research around this relationship between lawyers and organizers and like whether, um, whether or not like lawyers, you know, like fit into, fit into this like uh, work of like movement um, and how, if so. And um, I guess I was wondering like um, from both of you, like how do you, well, A, that's again, a broader question for um, everybody, but um, I was wondering specifically um, since we've been so focused on like, you know, like winning and so focused on like policy and legal changes, how, how do we like shift, shift us back towards like that, um, the focus of like collective power and collective building rather than um, focusing on uh, these like legal or policy wins? And like, how do you see um, lawyers and organizers fitting into that, um, shifting us back towards collective building um, rather than the focus on um, these 
tangible, or I guess like um, these policy wins. Thank you so much. And then one more on the front and then we'll answer them. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Sarah Reyes. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I wanna return again to the question of contradictions, which I really appreciated. And I, I love that Robin, you brought up Grace Lee Boggs. I think a lot about um, her work that told us that contending with contradictions and engaging with them and resolving them is where generative change happens. Um, so I wanna ask how you feel that we can bring that process into our work, particularly with the question that was just asked around contending with the contradiction between lawyering and revolutionary um, work to dismantle the system as a whole, how the process of contending with contradictions can itself be generative and how we can build practices in our organizations to do that work. Beautiful, thank y'all for those thoughtful questions. So we're gonna take the next 10 or so to answer them. I mean, uh, okay, <laughs> lawyering. You know, it's funny, I, I did wanna be a lawyer when I was young, just never, <laughs> never happened. So that's, um, I just, I think I'll respond to the first question around like this, this hyper focus on legal policy and electoral victories that have sort of been the uh, oftentimes the centered of what will bring us victory. I think it's just about under, it's about under, putting legal policy and electoral, and electoral um, strategies in context. The truth is, is that we're in harm mitigation mode. So I actually, I actually am not the person that says that we need to not actually think about legal policy and electoral strategies. I actually think that because of the moment throughout history, I've, and not, and also in this moment, we have to be in the in the, in, the, in 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 a position where we're thinking about how do we actually materially re re reduce the suffering of our people, even if it means harm mitigation. The question is, is how do we do it in a way that doesn't reinforce the state? but actually builds power for us. There is a way in which that we can engage in some of those, these strategies that actually build power for social movements, whether or not we win or, or, or we lose. But I, I do think that we have to put it in context. And at the end of the day, part of putting it in context is understanding that policy changes, legal changes, and electoral victories actually won't bring revolution. And it, we can't be afraid of the work of revolution. And the fact that it, 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 is, it is a long-term fight and strategy about the undoing of the systems that harm us, racial capitalism, white supremacy, and patriarchy. And, and so it's about understanding both without, without sort of rejecting the idea of that, that actual working on legal policy and electoral fights are, are, have a play a particular, a particular role. And the thing around lawyering, I, th I feel like I, this, this question always comes up. I just feel like we all have we all have a duty to reject this idea um, that lawyering, that that policy, that absolutely all of these things will bring us liber liberation, and also understand that understanding the law can is an asset to liber to a liberation fight. You you breaking down. I've worked with Marbury for years, and one thing I, I've 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 felt with her is I I am I am in the business of completely dismantling the system. So how do you work with me? in a way that doesn't like um, value your knowledge over mine, but how do you work with me in, in helping me think through how to actually tear apart the actual system? So it's, it's just about your, it's just for me, it's about the posture. As a lawyer, my, I am in relationship with you in the project of revolution. So how do we dismantle this entire system? And how am I actually putting the, this knowledge to work in the dismantling? And in the road there, how am I working to mitigate harms to, 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 to our people? That, that this is this is this is exactly why I wanted to follow you because I knew you're going to say this brilliant stuff. Um, and to go back to the question of lawyering, um, most of the the greatest lawyers around actually can't be here because they're locked up. Okay, just to remind you. Um, so when we ask the question, "What is lawyering?" Um, do you need to know the name Martin Sostra? You know, you need to know the name of all these people with basically jailhouse lawyers who who have been doing this work. And it's just like Tanjibwe said, just like many of you who came here, you understand the law actually matters, not because the law is the answer, not because we're trying to get the the. Imp I mean, it's bad enough that <laughs> we can't get. Um, the state to actually impose whatever is left of the rule of law. Um, I was, I was, I met three amazing people yesterday, and I was having this conversation about uh, the NYPD. People forget that the NYPD was the second largest drug dealer in New York, I, and I don't, and I mean that honestly. The second largest, 
dealer of heroin in New York was the NYPD. So it's like, wait a second, we can't even get the, the, the liberals talk about the rule of law, you, we don't have the rule of law. You know, still, it's really important to acknowledge the role that jailhouse lawyers in particular and others have played and all the lawyers who actually go to prison for the work that they do. So I think it's, it, it goes back to this question of whose side are you on? Um, Amakar Cabral talked about committing class suicide. You, you make a choice. And if you recognize that the court's not the savior, that the court is just one arena, that the real the struggles in the streets are the ones that matter, struggles to build power, to build institutions, then you make that, to, make that choice and decision. So I think that's the fundamental uh, answer. Finally, the question about um, Grace Lee Boggs and the work in Detroit and the question of contradictions. Um, you, you, in, in your question, you gave the answer, which is so eloquent, which is to say that, you know, we don't run away from contradictions. Um, and that also means, and, and Marx said this, Marx said this many times, um, you know, when, he's, when he actually says, uh, je ne suis pas Marxiste, he said, I'm not a Marxist. Part of it has to do with confronting the contradictions, even in the ideologies that we hold fast to, rather than keep going back to it like a Bible. You know, look, I'm an atheist. I'm very proud of it. So the Bible is useful to a certain point, but then after a while, you have to reject it for something else. And part of what Grace and James Boggs were saying is that at some point, if you're thinking dialectically, you're going to end up having to, through contradiction, uh, push beyond the ideologies that that before us. You know, and we keep calling them isms when we, we have to think beyond that. So people get mad at me. I said, we know we have to go beyond Marxism. Like, how could you go beyond Marxism? It's the answer for everything. That's not true. We don't have the answer for everything. It's just like Tinji Wei said. It's like we keep thinking we have the answer and we got to try to find it in the text when in fact we're trying to, we have to ask the right questions. And that's what Grace believed in. She said, you got to ask the right questions. And that's why she came toward the end of her life saying, you know, the most important struggle we have is a struggle to be human. Now I know all the post-humanists are like, great, you can't say that. But her definition of human was one in which that was kind of post-human. It was one in which we had to think how to remake ourselves as people in relationship to one another and to the planet and to uh, the, the lives of the plants and animals and everything that exists, our relationship to the past and, and future and present. And that's the work that you can't find in the text. That's the work that, that involves actual struggle. So struggle itself with each other, not trying to get likes on Facebook or whatever, not trying to get as many followers, but real struggle is what produces the kind of futures that would produce what? More contradictions. So it's not like it comes to an end. We have to confront those contradictions and not see them as a bad thing, but I see them as not even a simple sort of formulation of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. It's not even synthesis. It produces new problems and challenges to us. And that's something we can't run away from. And that's the point that um, both Marbre and Tinjiwe have lived. Don't run away from contradictions. You leap in them, struggle with them, with love. And that's what we have to do. That's our, that's our obligation. That, that's our responsibility. Let's give an amen to Robin D.G. Kelly. Because I just, I, the only thing I just want to like, the presence of contradictions are not an indication of failure. And I think we've kind of, we've, we've created this, this posture where we feel like it's a failure. Running away from contradictions or, or rejecting the idea that it's inherent within the, it, the, in the work of liberation, that is the failure. But I also just want to say how we engage with each other around contradictions is also equally important. And this is the concept of principled struggle. We have been taught two different ways of engaging in either difference or contradictions. Politeness, which means I'm not gonna tell you the truth, I'm gonna smile on your face and I'm gonna talk shit about you when I leave. Or destruction, which is taught to us by capitalism. We are in the business of, of learning a third way, which is principled struggle. It means you're not leaning towards liberalism and politeness. We can disagree with each other. In fact, creating the conditions for disagreement is what creates generative struggle and tension. So we will not move towards politeness, but nor will I destroy you or destroy the institutions or the organizations that we've built. I will engage in principled struggle. That is, that is the work that we are up to. 
is how are we in struggle in relationship to each other? Because my guy, if we either lie into each other, we talking shit behind our back, or we fighting in the room like it's wartime in here, and we don't center loving each other, I swear to God, sometimes I'm in a meeting, if like, and I, I say, if I'm in a four to five hour meeting with you and I haven't laughed or smiled at you once, we got problems. You understand me? If I can't tell you the truth, we have problems. Our job is building beloved community. You cannot be in organizations that do not center love, struggle. You can, joy. We did not come here, our ancestors did not work this hard for us to fight with each other and lie. Right. Right. Do you understand me? We have to model a kind of radical love that shows us in our bones what is possible. We have to model with ourselves in our organizations, in our movement, the kind of liberation that we're trying to build. That's the real work that we're up to. I got that award this morning, so. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to say amen, even for the atheists, because that was very powerful. Thank y'all, for real. Um, there was so much there to sit with, um, and I want to invite folks. So this is online. It's going to be recorded. I think we're going to try to get a transcript for our folks inside, but also for folks who, who process that way. But I want to thank y'all. There was just so much richness this morning. Um, and I'm so grateful for your leadership and your thoughts. Um, I just need to, I think, pull out two things and then I have some announcements and then we'll late. Some will be like, <laughs> go to your sessions if you want to. Um, but I think this idea that winning is not building power and that means that losing can be building power too. Um, and I think that's important because in the law, so much of what kind of what taught is success is about actually winning in a courtroom or winning in a in a state house. And so remembering that just because you passed the law, you might not have built power at the end of that. And just because you lost the case doesn't mean you didn't build power. And so what does it actually mean to be engaged in power building, which is about organizing and relationship? And that shit's hard, right? And tiring. Um, but what does that mean to engage that? And then I think, I just want to say, this is the second person, and I hope not the last, who has mentioned Cabral, who said, claim no easy victories and tell no lies, but also this idea of class suicide. And we should be clear about who is in this room <laughs> for the most part and what that means about all class and what class suicide means. And not where you came from, but where you are right now. And so being clear about what the mandate is um, around that and what it means for us to actually move through that revolutionary. And then lastly, I wanna just repeat what Tinjiwe said, which is I am in search of the right question that I don't know the answer to. And we are taught, I think through capitalism, through law school, through whatever, places we've been where we got validation that you have to know the answer and that you're a failure if you don't. But I think this call of like actually like not knowing the question and then saying, I don't know, like let alone the question, <laughs> I don't know the answer either opens us up to a humility that allows us to build with people in a way that we can win. And so I want to just like those for me were three things that I'm going to like sit with <laughs> for a second. That and this struggle and like you know, whether we're destroying or being polite. So I want to just thank you both so much for all of that. That was beautiful. So one more, amen, applause. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Tenji Ray Robin. So let me, um, there's some quick announcements y'all need to have before you leave. So one is, um, we know that there aren't enough spaces to have the conversations y'all wanna have. And we recognize that that's one of the limitations um, of a conference and of time. But what we've done for lunch today is invite anyone who wants to, to sign up to, to self-organize a strategy session. So if there's a question that you're struggling with, if there's something you wanna talk about, you wanna hold space for, there is a sign up on the back wall right before you leave, you see that like long white sheet. Well, there are six rooms and we're just inviting folks, if you wanna host a conversation to put your um, conversation topic down and anyone can join. We'll move this sheet of paper to the lunch area at lunch so people can just go and join. But if you wanna talk about abolition of the Supreme Court or how to hold this contradiction, that's the place to do it. So go ahead and sign up. Secondly, if someone left a cell phone at registration, if you don't have it yet, go get your cell phone. Um, 
We also, yesterday, there were a bunch of parking validations that we weren't able to give to folks, and parking is expensive here. Um, and so if you are somebody who had to pay for parking and didn't get free validation, please go back to the registration um, and give them your name and email address, and Kim will be in touch with you to take care of that. We also have swag on sale. It's cute. It's teal, those sweatshirts, those hoodies, those folios. They said lawyers like folios. I got some folios. Um, but it's all right kind of behind the lunchroom. So when y'all get lunch, please pursue the swag. There also is, or peruse, there also is um, some books. Left Bank Books has, from Haymarket, has sent a bunch of books for you to look at if you want to buy some. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, lastly, so from 10.30 to 12.30 is Poly Ed. It's two hour sessions. It's a chance for us to sharpen some of what Tinjiwe and Robin shared. Most folks I think have the app, but I know there's been a lot of like issues navigating that. And so we also are putting schedules on the back wall here by the lunchroom and by registration. So if you wanna see um, the different sessions and pick one, they are up on the wall for you to check out. And again, y'all, thank you so much both for being here, but also for being present at 9 a.m. Um, and coming with the questions. So we'll see you all day long. Thank you again.